between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of. And on to this, Conan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Welcome, dear listener, to another episode of Conan Chronicles, the review and retrospective podcast on all things Conan the Barbarian. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the fourth Conan story in publication order, Black Colossus. This story was, of course, written by Mr. Robert E. Howard and published for the first time in the July 1933 issue of Weird Tales magazine. Our story begins in one of the vast deserts of the Hyborian Age, southeast of the lands of Shem. In this desert, a city dead for 3,000 years, named Kuthchemis, lies in ruin. Within the lost city, we meet one of the most fearless and cunning thieves of the Hyborian Age, named Shivatis. The thief makes his way through the ancient city, half buried in sand or eroded away, and finds a tomb that causes him to cower in fear. In the midst of that vastness, the glimmering fangs of the ruins, the columns standing up like broken masts of sunken ships, all dominated by the towering ivory dome before which Shavata stood trembling. The base of this dome was a gigantic pedestal of marble rising from what had once been a terraced eminence on the banks of the ancient river. Broad steps led up to a great bronze door in the dome, which rested on its base like the half of some titanic egg. The dome itself was of pure ivory, which shone as if unknown hands kept it polished. Likewise shone the spired gold cap of the pinnacle, and the inscription which sprawled about the curve of the dome in golden hieroglyphics yards long. Any fool could see there was something unnatural about the structure. The winds and suns of 3,000 years had lashed it, yet its gold and ivory rose bright and glistening as the day it was reared by nameless hands on the bank of the nameless river. This unnaturalness was in keeping with the general aura of these devil-haunted ruins. In that ivory dome lay the bones of Thugra Kortan, the dark sorcerer who had reigned in Kuthchimis 3,000 years ago when the kingdoms of Stygia stretched far northward of the great river, over the meadows of Shem, and into the uplands. Legend had it that Thugra Khotan was a powerful dark wizard who ruled from Kuthchemis, the seat of power in a mighty empire. However, all empires eventually end, as did Thugra Khotan's. An army of barbarians invaded and shattered the sorcerer's kingdom, drenching the once thriving capital in bloodshed before unseen. While the barbarians were literally pounding at the gates of Kuthchemis, the sorcerer locked himself away in this ancient tomb, preserving his life, but leaving him in a slumber that lasted for thousands of years. Shavata steps inside the tomb and makes his way through, almost being killed by a giant snake, before he accidentally awakens the evil wizard. The wizard kills the thief, 
and assumes a new masked identity, Noah Thuk, the Veiled One, and sets out to reconquer the lands that were ripped from his grasp by the barbarian invaders 3,000 years ago. With the help of the wizard's magic, the Veiled One's army rides out of the desert and raises kingdom after kingdom, leaving only destruction in their wake. The kingdom of Kojara suffers heavily once the invaders reach them, and their arrival could not have been at a worse time. While Kojara's border territories are razed by the army, the kingdom finds itself in political turmoil. Kojara's young king had been kidnapped before the events of the story, taken away by the treacherous king of Ophir, leaving the duties of head of state to his sister, the beautiful princess Yasmela. As the invading army approaches, the princess is visited by a specter of evil. She lay and writhed in pure horror that froze the blood in her lithe limbs and dilated her beautiful eyes. Above her, in the darkest corner of the marble chamber, lurked a vast, shapeless shadow. It was no living thing of form or flesh and blood. It was a clot of darkness, a blur in the sight, a monstrous night-born incubus that might have been deemed a figment of a sleep-drugged brain, but for the points of blazing yellow fire that glimmered like two eyes from the blackness. Moreover, a voice issued from it, a low, subtle, inhuman sibilance that was more like the soft, abominable hissing of a serpent than anything else, and that apparently could not emanate from anything with human lips. Its sound, as well as its import, filled Yasmela with a shuddering horror so intolerable that she writhed and twisted her slender body as if beneath a lash, as though to rid her mind of its insinuating vileness by physical contortion. You are marked for mine, princess, came the gloating whisper. Before I wakened from the long sleep, I had mocked you and yearned for you. But I was held fast by the ancient spell by which I escaped mine enemies. I am the soul of Natok, the Veiled One. Look well upon me, princess. Soon you shall behold me in my bodily guise, and shall love me. The desert is a rose garden beneath the moon, where blossom the fires of a hundred thousand warriors, as an avalanche sweeps onward, gathering bulk and momentum. I will sweep into the lands of mine ancient enemies. Their kings shall furnish me skulls for goblets. Their women and children shall be slaves of my slaves' slaves. I have grown strong in the long years of dreaming. But thou shalt be my queen, O princess. Desperate to resist the evil sorcerer, Yasmela resorts to praying to the god Mitra, whom the people of Kojara had abandoned long ago for some sort of guidance. The god tells her that she should wander the streets of the city that night, and give command of Kojara's army to the first man she meets on the street. The princess does as the god asks, and quickly meets a strange man she'd never seen anything quite like before. The approaching figure went not furtively, like a thief, or timidly, like a fearful traveler. He strode down the nighted street as one who has no need or desire to walk softly. An unconscious swagger was in his stride, and his footfalls resounded on the pave. The torchlight glinted dully on the polished blue steel of his greaves and bassinet. A more baleful fire glittered bluely in his eyes. At first glance, she saw he was no Cothian. When he spoke, she knew he was no Hyborian. There was a wolfishness about this warrior that marked the barbarian. The eyes of no civilized man, however wild or criminal, ever blazed with such a fire. Wine scented his breath, but he neither staggered nor stammered. Have they shut you into the street? He asked in barbarous Cothic, 
reaching for her. His fingers closed lightly about her rounded wrist, but she felt that he could splinter its bones without effort. I have but come from the last wine shop open. Ishtar's curse on these white-livered reformers who close the grog houses. Let men sleep rather than guzzle, they say. Aye, so they can work and fight better for their masters. Soft-gutted eunuchs, I call them. When I served with the mercenaries of Corinthia, we swilled and wenched all night and fought all day. Aye, blood ran down the channels of our swords. But what of you, my girl? The princess tells the bewildered Conan, currently a lowly mercenary captain in the employ of the Kojaran army, of the command given to her by Mitra. After some persuading, Conan accepts the princess's offer and smugly offends the regal sensibilities of Yasmela's court. Tomorrow we march southward, she answered, and there is the man who shall lead you. Jerking aside the velvet curtains, she dramatically indicated the Cimmerian. It was perhaps not an entirely happy moment for the disclosure. Conan was sprawled in his chair, his feet propped on the ebony table, busily engaged in gnawing a beef bone, which he gripped firmly in both hands. He glanced casually at the astounded nobles, grinned faintly at Amalric, and went on munching with undisguised relish. Mitra, protect us! exploded Amalric. That's Conan the Northrun, the most turbulent of all my rogues. I'd have hanged him long ago were he not the best swordsman that ever donned hauberk. Your Highness is pleased to jest, cried Thespides, his aristocratic features darkening. This man is a savage, a fellow of no culture or breeding. It is an insult to ask gentlemen to serve under him. The members of the court eventually acquiesce to the princess's wishes after some harsh words, and Conan changes into the regal plate armor of a Kojaran general, giving the barbarian his first spark of kingly ambitions. The princess and her new general marshal the combined forces of Kojara and march out into the desert to meet the invading horde of the Veiled One. While the pair travels together, Yasmela becomes enchanted by the Sumerian's wild and exotic charm. She begins to develop romantic feelings for her general and protector, but before the two can act on their chemistry, a thick, mystical fog rolls across the battlefield. Conan presses his ear against the earth in suspicion and feels the vibrations of thousands of feet, horses, and chariots charging towards the Kojarans, concealed by the mist. The horde charges through their master's magical smokescreen, revealing an army that greatly outnumbers the Kojarans. Conan leaps into action, commanding the army with a confidence and strategic insight beyond his years. Despite the Kojarans' inferior numbers, Conan is able to strategically keep the invading army at bay before the evil sorcerer arrives on the battlefield, slinging spells of terrible explosive power at his enemies. With the battle at a virtual stalemate, the wizard flies across the battlefield in his magic chariot, behind the Kojaran lines, and steals Yasmela for himself. Conan leaps onto a riderless horse in the midst of battle and pursues the chariot into one of the desert ruins of the wizard's long-dead kingdom. Inside, Conan confronts the wizard, who conjures a cobra and black scorpions to kill the barbarian. In a last-ditch effort, Conan hurls his sword at the Veiled One with all of his might. The blow lands, impaling the sorcerer through the chest, killing him instantly. Yasmela rejoices, and tells the barbarian that with the danger past, he could finally be hers. The two embrace, acting on the sexual tension between them as the story ends. Perhaps even more so than the prior Robert E. Howard Conan stories, Black Colossus is a consummate sword and sorcery adventure story. We have all of the sort of elements present here that would go on to become tropes of this genre. We have the beautiful princess who serves as the damsel in distress. We have the evil wizard threatening the sanctity of the kingdom. We have an epic battle between armies clad in armor and chainmail. And finally, we have the heroic adventurer who saves both the damsel and the kingdom by the end. 
As far as plots go, Black Colossus is classic fantasy, if not sort of standard heroic adventure. There are very few surprises here. You don't get anything like an elephant-headed alien man or monsters of Lovecraftian horror in this one. Even while people like Robert E. Howard and Tolkien were pioneering the sword and sorcery or high fantasy genre in the 1930s and 40s, things like the damsel in distress trope, for example, were already cliches from prior works of literature, mythology, and semi-historical legend. While it doesn't make the cliches present here suddenly groundbreaking and innovative or anything, I still think it's important to consider the context in which Howard was writing these stories in the pages of Weird Tales. In the Robert E. Howard Complete Conan collection that I'm reading, the man who compiled the stories, uh, who's named Finn J.D. John, uh, usually writes some sort of foreword to each story explaining a bit of the context in which each individual story was written. He'll talk about general things going on at the time in the world, as well as Howard's personal life that informed the way that the stories were written. In the foreword, he wrote for The Slithering Shadow, which is the one directly after this one in publication order. Uh, he talks about how that story begins what he calls the middle period of Conan stories. He says that stories written in this middle period relied much more heavily on cliches because as the Great Depression ravaged the American economy, Howard, like many other people, became much poorer and was in desperate need of money. So in the interest of getting as much of his work published as possible so that he could get paid, Howard began including a variety of cliches that the Weird Tales editors liked or thought that the readers would like more. These elements included, quote, ancient ruins, a shapely woman in distress, a supernatural foe to defeat, and an ending scene with Conan, arm around the aforementioned woman, loudly and happily looking forward to a future full of open seas and easy plunder. I wasn't able to find exact hard and fast dates as to when these stories were originally written rather than published, uh, so I'll assume that John was classifying the second period as those that were written either when the stock market collapsed in 1929 or shortly thereafter when Howard was really feeling the global economic downturn of his day. But I gotta say, I did find this a little odd because other than the ending of this story lacking open seas and easy plunder, it has all of the cliches that were listed in his forward for the next story. This isn't to say that I thought Black Colossus was a poorly written story or anything, or that it wasn't entertaining despite the genre tropes present here. I would imagine that for many people who are hardcore sword and sorcery or heroic adventure fiction fans, this might even be a positive, as these are conventions that attracted them to the genre in the first place. I myself quite enjoyed the injection of romance and a female character that's more than a name mentioned in passing into a Conan story for the first time here. Yasmela isn't as fleshed out as Conan, given the fact that this is a short story where sacrifices have to be made to accommodate the length, but she does seem like she has a decent head on her shoulders, and I did buy that she would be attracted to a man like Conan in this situation. She really responds to Conan's exotic, untamed wildness and his ability to protect her from the magic of the evil wizard where members of her royal court had previously failed. Conan's barbaric ways and physical power also frighten Yasmela at certain points in the story because, I mean, she's a woman who was raised in the highest privilege afforded to anyone during her time in history. This adds a sort of dangerousness to their love, or lust in this case, I suppose, which is pretty interesting. Their relationship is more of a lustful thing than anything else, but I think it's appropriate for these characters at these two points in their lives, and given the amount of real estate that Howard has to work with, with this being a short story. At this point in time, Conan is hardly a man that's ready to fall in love or even really wants to. He's mostly concerned with fighting, thieving, exploring, drinking, and really sleeping with whoever he's infatuated with at the moment during this stage in his life. He doesn't really have any desire to plant roots anywhere. Despite the tropes which are admittedly noticeable, if you've read any other story in the sword and sorcery or high fantasy genre, this one mostly gets by on the character moments we get with Conan throughout, and the dark fantasy setting that Howard brings to the table once again. I have to say that of all the stories I've done retrospective reviews on so far on Conan Chronicles, 
This story, I think, has the strongest characterization for Conan. Howard gets a lot of mileage out of plucking Conan from the grungy commoner taverns and placing him for the first time as a young man amongst the Hyborgian Age's nobility. Conan is a complete fish out of water amongst these people. He offends them with his lack of etiquette, his arrogance, his appetite for hedonism, and how good he is at what he does, which is killing things. Howard writes what I thought were some pretty funny moments here. In one of them, Conan sits with his feet propped up on a table, he's drinking, he's eating a hunk of meat with his hands, and this is all while the nobles are trying to figure out whether the princess was crazy for choosing such a barbarian to be their leader. Conan's irreverence for all of the pomp and circumstance that comes with their lofty positions within the monarchy and their disgust with him, I thought was pretty funny. We also get to see some key moments in Conan's path to become the man we meet later in time in the pages of the Phoenix on the Sword and the Scarlet Citadel. It's here amongst these nobles, as Conan wears fancy plate armor fit for a commander, that he forms his ambitions to one day become a king himself. We also get to see Conan command an army for the first time, relying on his natural instincts rather than the formal military playbooks that the other military leaders of the kingdom employ. Conan is shown to be an adept military commander, and whether this can be chalked up to his inherent natural talent, or Conan simply being the avatar of Mitra's intervention on behalf of the princess, is unclear. However, the battle Conan gets into here is just as epic as the ones in prior stories like the Scarlet Citadel. You also get to see Conan's personality come out a bit more while on the battlefield. In this fight, he's laughing madly and possessed by what Howard describes as the quote, wild beast instinct to slay before he died. In a hurricane of thundering steel, the lines twisted and swayed. It was war-bred noble against professional soldier. Shields crashed against shields, and between them, spears drove in and blood spurted. All along the crests of the ridges, the combat raged in blind, gasping ferocity. Tooth and nail, frothing mad with fanaticism and ancient feuds, the tribesmen rent and slew and died. It seemed to Conan that his sweat-blinded eyes looked down into a rising ocean of steel that seethed and eddied, filling the valley from ridge to ridge. The fight was at a bloody deadlock. The hillmen held the ridges, and the mercenaries, gripping their dripping pikes, bracing their feet in the bloody earth, held the pass. Superior position and armor for a space balanced the advantage of overwhelming numbers. But it could not endure. Wave after wave of glaring faces and flashing spears surged up the slope, and Conan abandoned all hope of victory and of life. He did not glance toward Yasmela's pavilion. He had forgotten the princess. His one thought was the wild beast instinct to slay before he died. This day you become knights, he laughed fiercely, pointing with his dripping sword toward the hillman horses herded nearby. Mount and follow me to hell! The hill steeds reared wildly under the unfamiliar clash of the Kothic armor, and Conan's gusty laugh rose above the din as he led them to where the eastern ridge branched away from the plateau. Five hundred footmen, pauper patricians, younger sons, black sheep, on half-wild Shemite horses, charging an army down a slope where no cavalry had ever dared charge before. These moments where Howard gets to let Conan's personality shine were the highlights of the story for me. Howard also does a great job, as always, with the Hyborian Age setting that really adds to both the dark fantasy vibe that Conan is famous for and the mythic feeling of the story. In the story, we meet Princess Yasmela, the acting ruler of a kingdom that affords at least her family wealth and privilege. No luxuries seem beyond the royal family's grasp. The kingdom also seems to have a bit of a puritanical streak about it, as Conan complains that taverns have to close early at night because, in his view, the powerful want their armies and workforce to be healthier to serve their respective roles in society. 
However, after being visited by the spirit of a man who tells her that he is essentially going to steal her, force her to be his wife, and serve him in all manners sexually, she bursts out into the streets, looking for the man Mitra told her of, the one that would lead her army against the forces of the evil sorcerer, and finds a city where assassins and thieves lie around every corner. Even though this story doesn't take place in a city of thieves like the Tower of the Elephant, the Hyborian Age kingdom where the story is set still feels more dangerous than many high fantasy worlds I've read before. This is a bleak chapter in humanity's history, and Howard doesn't shy away from that fact ever. Howard relays the culture of these people through their eyes. There's much talk when the princess is speaking with her handmaiden towards the beginning of the story about the way religion works during this time. Howard writes of gods that entire civilizations had long abandoned, only to call on these gods again in moments of desperation. Princess Yasmela's people abandoned their old god Mitra. After influence by a foreign religion swept through the kingdom, and most people began worshipping other gods instead. This influence by foreign peoples and cultures is spoken of very negatively. The people of the Hyborian Age are tribal, scared of the alien ways of people far away that they don't really understand. The reason people are like this in Howard's world is that in this prehistoric age, civilizations rise, stand for sometimes even thousands of years, and then fall. Atlantis, for example, was one of the civilizations in Howard's world that dominated the age before the Hyborian one, where all of the Conan stories take place. Atlantis sank, and some Atlanteans did escape the utter destruction of their empire, but left to the wilderness without the means of sustaining civilization, the survivors of the Atlantean Empire's collapse retreated back into barbarism. Without the means of sustaining the robust culture of an advanced civilization, with things like civil organizations and written records of the knowledge that kept their society afloat technologically and culturally deep below the sea, the Atlanteans de-evolved back into archaic humans, which is something like a Neanderthal. Such is the cycle of civilizations in Howard's imagination. They rise to a height of decadence and power before unseen, only to eventually fall, leaving their once mighty people struggling to tinker with stone tools. This is why the people of the Hyborian Age carry tribal blood feuds with them, have racist attitudes, and view outsiders as either exotic or dangerous. The stakes of losing a war between empires in this mythical past is the destruction of a civilization so thoroughly that they and future generations of their people will lose everything they have ever accomplished for hundreds, if not thousands of years. You can imagine why people once living in bustling metropolises would teach their children to hate other people who were responsible for robbing them of everything they once had. This is a story about the attempted resurrection of an old empire. We have an evil tyrant who attempted to prolong his life by sleeping in an ancient tomb and resurrected an army to take back his civilization, whose greatest accomplishments lie in ruin at the beginning of the story. A plea to halt this being accomplished was met by intervention of the gods, choosing Conan as the destined hero to reject this break in the cyclical nature of imperial rise, decline, and fall? Is it the will of the gods like Mitra to intervene in the affairs of man to make things like this happen? That's unclear, but Conan certainly does rather well as a commander for a man who's never done anything like that before. To me anyway, he certainly seemed touched by the grace of Mitra. The grim state of the world that these stories take place in is why I find Conan interesting as a fantasy universe. It makes sense that in a world this brutal, the person who would appear as a hero as a man like Conan. Conan is amoral, but he's not evil. He likes to drink, he likes to fight, he likes to kill, and he likes to steal. He will help people in moments where his conscience allows him to empathize with others, but he's generally a very self-preservationist kind of person and will sacrifice any idea of morality if it stands in the way of him getting what he wants and surviving. Chivalry isn't really in Conan's vocabulary, but for him, no person unlike this barbarian would have made it out of the conditions he was born in. Sumerians are a very distant offshoot tribe of the Atlanteans who were knocked back to the Stone Age when Atlantis sank thousands of years ago. Coming from a primitive civilization, 
Conan knew that to survive, something had to be killed every day to eat, and he had to be strong and good at fighting to do this. Stealing from or killing anything, animal or human, to survive hardened Conan. He didn't really have the luxury of thinking about whether killing another person, for example, was necessary. If he didn't kill the man attempting to murder his family and pillage his home, he'd die and everyone he loved would lose everything they ever had. Black Colossus doesn't go all out in explaining all of these things I've talked about, like Howard's cyclical nature of empires and how it affects the various human characters in his world, but he does have a series bible about the Hyborian Age that he stays consistent with throughout all the Conan stories. He published it in the form of an essay called The Hyborian Age, and as you go through the stories you can see these sorts of elements pop up in the characterization of the people in the stories and the places Conan visits, which is really cool. This sort of thing makes the setting feel rich, alive, dark, and dangerous even if you haven't read the essay. It just feels like a fully formed and complete world. The people in Black Colossus feel like they're consistent with Howard's vision of this savage and brutal time. Howard also gives the way magic and the gods work in the Conan universe a mythic quality that I quite liked here. If you read the old Greek myths, um, the one that specifically popped into my mind when reading this was the Iliad, but many of those stories are about wars between rivaling kingdoms, the intervention by the gods in these petty squabbles of mankind, and hero warriors who take glory in conquest and plunder. The way that magic is used by the evil sorcerer in this one reminded me of things from the Iliad, like how Apollo creates a plague to weaken the Achaean army after being prayed to. In this story, we have a princess who prays to Mitra for help in defending her kingdom against Thugra Khotan's horde, and the god directly intervenes to change the course of destiny. It's only by Mitra's intervention that Conan is given command of the kingdom's forces. Undeterred by the god's intervention, the Veiled One still harasses the princess in a ghostly form, causes some explosions, and creates a dense fog that obscures his army on the battlefield. These sorts of things give Black Colossus a mythic feel that makes the story feel like a fable from a lost civilization. The weakest aspect of the story for me was, again, the villain here. Thugra Khotan, or Natok the Veiled One, as he calls himself after his resurrection, gets a rather cool introduction at the beginning of the story. A thief infiltrates his thousands-of-year-old tomb, accidentally awakens him, and he rides out of the desert to reconquer what he believes is rightfully his. After that, I felt like he left much to be desired. He gets a few scenes where he appears as a ghost to tell the princess that he wants to take her as his queen, and that's pretty much it. The initial concept of the character is really interesting to me. It's sort of the Conan universe version of an Egyptian pharaoh rising from the dead as a mummy, like an old Universal Monster movie or something. However, I have to say that the character's menace sort of vanishes completely when Conan disposes of him quickly, and the story abruptly ends. Don't get me wrong, summoning scorpions and cobras would freak me out, uh, but Conan just sort of throws his sword at him and he dies. It's not enough to ruin the story, but I think it's a bit anticlimactic. The coolest thing that Thugra Khotan does here is use magic to influence the outcome of the battle he engages in with Conan and Yasmela's forces. All in all, despite its more traditional approach in adhering to the various tropes of adventure fiction I mentioned earlier, I still quite enjoyed Black Colossus. Conan's personality really shines through here. Yasmela is a great addition to the story as the first injection of romance into Conan's life we've seen thus far. And Howard still brings the Hyborian Age setting with all of its richness to the table. It's not quite my favorite of the Conan stories that I've read so far, that still belongs to the Tower of the Elephant, but I'd still say this is a quality Conan outing from Howard. Alright, so since we're at the end here, I'd like to first ask you, dear listener, to please comment below to share your thoughts on The Black Colossus if you've read it, or anything else Conan really. Let's get some discussions going in the comments. In the description of this video, I've posted a link to the free YouTube audiobook of Black Colossus I excerpted in this video. It was uploaded by a person named Frederick, uh, who has uploaded many other Robert E. Howard audiobooks to his channel. 
Robert E. Howard uh, Conan stories are so old that they're in the public domain, and many people have made Conan audiobooks of their own on YouTube for these Howard stories due to the less stringent copyright protections, and that's really cool. I personally find audiobooks to be a very easy way of consuming novels and short stories because I can listen to them while doing other things. The Howard Conan stories are usually relatively short, about an hour or two long, so it's a nice thing to put on while you have some chores to do around the house or something, so check that audiobook out if you're so inclined. I also have links to all of the Conan Chronicles social media pages in the description. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter, so whatever major social media platform you prefer, I've got pages for the show where you can follow us. On those pages, I usually post cool Conan art that I stumble across while compiling the visuals for each episode and updates on the show, so check those out so you'll never miss an episode. There's also a link in the description to the Conan Chronicles Patreon page. I'm hoping to have some exclusive content for patrons on there very soon, but for now, it's just a way for you to support the show if you really enjoy what I do here. Any bit you can chip in really helps. Finally, I'd like to say please consider subscribing and liking the video if you enjoyed it, as that'll help the show and the Conan fan community grow to reach a wider audience here on YouTube. With all of that said, I'd like to extend an invitation to you, dear listener, for the next episode. The fifth episode in my series on the Robert E. Howard Conan stories will focus on The Slithering Shadow, published all the way back in 1933. For now, dear listener, I bid you farewell. He seated himself near her on a boulder, his broadsword across his knees. With the firelight glinting from his blue steel armor, he seemed like an image of steel, dynamic power for the moment quiescent. Not resting, but motionless for the instant, awaiting the signal to plunge again into terrific action. The firelight played on his features, making them seem as if carved out of a substance shadowy yet hard as steel. They were immobile, but his eyes smoldered with fierce life. He was not merely a wild man. He was part of the wild, one with the untamable elements of life, in his veins ran the blood of the wolf pack. In his brain lurked the brooding depths of the northern night. His heart throbbed with the fire of blazing forests. Conan listened unperturbed. War was his trade. Life was a continual battle or series of battles. Since his birth, death had been a constant companion. It stalked horrifically at his side stood at his shoulder beside the gaming tables. Its bony fingers rattled the wine cups. It loomed above him, a hooded and monstrous shadow when he lay down to sleep. He minded its presence no more than a king minds the presence of his cupbearer. Someday, its bony grasp would close. That was all. It was enough that he lived through the present.